I'm certainly glad God is, because we are not. I love that introduction there. I am. I am. Oh, well, we do have some announcements to get us started this morning. Before we do that, good morning to everyone who's with us here in person and those of you that are joining us online. Good morning as well. At Dad's funeral yesterday, I, you know, I think I mentioned this last week that it was really sad that I'd not seen Dad's name pop up on the live feed anymore, but um, he's sitting in the presence of our Savior. Uh -huh. So he's in that live stream, and I can't get a hold of that one, so <laughs> he's doing better than I am. Well, uh, first up on our announcements this morning, we have the final part of our Footsteps of the Savior sermon today, Following Jesus When You Need Grace, and then we will finish up the Bible study this Wednesday night. So please join us right here at 7 o'clock for that. Then following very quickly, seems like, we'll just say it's like, what, two weeks away, but it'll be here like tomorrow, is our next men's breakfast, May 6, 9 a.m., where the Bibles are sitting over there. We'll have the griddle set up again for pancakes and sausage, and I'm sure there'll be eggs and... Something else? Borscht. No, I think we're gonna skip the biscuits and gravy this time, oh, Dad. I won't be here, Dad. Okay, we'll have biscuits and gravy. We don't want any to miss out. Uh, we like to have fun with the biscuits and gravy. It's kind of a running joke. Then coming up that evening at 6 o'clock, we will be having our May movie. Um, we have some possibilities for that. We have to finalize those here real quick. Uh, again, we're looking at all the licensing and what that looks like. So that, watch our social media accounts, our website, and those things. And we'll even throw it out in the church chat uh, once we have it so that everybody knows. And then the following week, we will have the May races for Orange Track Racing. Uh, we'll convert from a restaurant to a sanctuary, or no, restaurant to a movie theater, back to the sanctuary, back to a race track, and then back to a sanctuary again in a matter of very short time. But uh, it is a great thing that we're able to do and have a lot of fun with. So that gets us through our announcements this morning. So let's open up with a word of prayer. Holy Father, we just thank you for the day that you've given. And although today is much different outside than it was yesterday or will be tomorrow, we know that you are in control. Father, we just thank you for all the many blessings in our lives. We thank you for the message that we will hear this morning. And we just look forward to being able to take that information, take this lesson, and use it in our lives as we move forward in Jesus' name. Amen. Our call to worship this morning comes from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Paul writes, He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Now yesterday, uh, we got to have our youngest, Aubrey, come over, and she got to open up her first birthday gifts. And, you know, we talk about opening up this free gift of salvation. And this, this you know, how God has saved us and given us this whole life. But the illustration from this is that she took all the, she, one, she's real good at taking, you know, wrap paper out of the bag and throw it all over the place. But what she did is what we can't do. She walked over where mom had thrown all that paper into the little garbage in the living room, and she was taking it back out. We gotta leave it in there. We gotta leave it at the foot of the cross, because He did call us to a holy life, one where we leave all that behind, and He gives us a purpose in life, and He does it through that free gift of grace. And no matter what you're going through right now. You may, I'm talking to people, you may have had a hard week. I had a friend from high school message me at 12.03 last night that his younger brother had passed. He doesn't know any of the specifics. He doesn't know what's going on, but he is reeling from the loss of his younger brother. And all he wanted is he reached out for prayer. He knew he needed that grace. 
It's grace that we've been given before time began as we know it and will last for eternity. Life ends. Eternity where? Father, as we prepare to bring Pastor Mark up here, we just pray for him as well this morning, Father. We pray that this migraine that has been bothering him, that it would just dissipate. It would go away. That as he comes up here, that he is able to see the words that he has written. And, and if he can't see those words, that you will just bring them out from him, as I know you can only do. But Father, as we hear this message on grace, it's a message for every day, all day, all of our lives, and into eternity. Father, let us hear this message. Let it resonate with us. And thank you for giving this message to Mark. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. How's everyone this morning? Uh, well, yesterday was Dad's 96th birthday, so I think it's just fitting, seeing as how he's sitting here we're patiently waiting with a piece of birthday cake in front of him. <laughs> We'll sing him happy birthday this week. <coughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Lord. Happy birthday to you. And many more. <laughs> <laughs> we always hope. So today's message that uh, we have is following the footsteps of the Savior when we need grace. And that's all the time. We need God's grace all the time. And grace is a subject that means different things to different people. But what does the Bible actually say about grace? Well, first off, it's mentioned over 150 times in the Bible, beginning in Genesis where Noah and his family had found grace in the eyes of God, and they were spared upon the ark. And then God went forward and used Noah and his family to bring restoration, future restoration, to the world. And it's because of that grace that we're here today. It's because of that grace that we have all of the creatures around us. Everything else was wiped out in the flood. So God's grace starts at the very beginning at Genesis, goes all the way up to the very last line in Revelation. Revelation 22, 21 says, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. And what he's talking about is he, he just got done describing all of the things that are about to come and, and the trials and the tribulation, the absolute tribulation that is coming and is going to befall all of those who do not stand with Christ. And it will be by God's grace that we are removed from that and that we are saved. Recently in my sermon, I talked about <coughs> grace and mercy and how they are integral with our faith. They blend together. See, without grace, we would be dead in our sins. And without mercy, we would not receive grace. That's really a key point, and I've got several concepts in here today in my message that I want you to, you know, kind of take with you, pay, pay close attention, put it in your pocket, take it with you for the week, if you will. And as such, grace is the most important concept that's taught in the Bible. As I mentioned uh, in Scripture, it's filled with verses of God's grace. And even though it's not something we deserve... God is kind enough and wants the best for our lives, so he gifts us with grace. See, grace isn't something that we can earn. Grace is only be given by the grace of God. It's a gift that we receive from God. And simply put, grace is the unmerited, unearned love and favor of God. Mercy is giving us what we don't deserve. And blessings in our lives are how God gives us both through his love for us. And I'm sure you've probably heard some of that before.
But it's really, really important that grace is the unmerited, unearned love and favor of God, which means he's pouring these things out on us, an agape love, grace that's undeserved. We can't do anything in our lives to earn grace or mercy. By understanding fully what the Word of God teaches us about grace, you'll come to see this wonderful Creator and Father who's giving us, out of His generous goodness and His favor, He gives us His grace freely and openly. And as I've said many times, we still have to do our part. He gives us the gifts, but we have to put them into action. And in return for his grace, mercy, and love, God desires a close relationship with him as we would desire for our own children to whom we give good gifts. And the scripture tells us about that in there that, you know, if you would give your children good gifts, how much more will God give to us in return? 2 Corinthians 9 and 8 says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. See, grace enables us to go forth and do that work. And it's this grace that he's giving to us in all things and at all times. A lot of times we just don't recognize that God's grace is still being poured out of us when we think we're at the very lowest part of the pit in life. But see, his grace is still there. His grace is still being poured out from him. We have to do our part. We have to reach up and reach our hand out to God and say, hey, take my hand, pull me out of the pit. By your grace, by your mercy, and because of your love. When we look into the word of God, it tells us how grace reconciles us to God. And that's a very important concept, that grace actually reconciles. That means brings us back into the presence of God, reconciles us with God. So this concept that I want you to hold on to is God's grace both is a gift and a response to that gift. So that's what I'm talking about. God gives us the gifts, but we have to respond. We have to take that gift and put it into use. And I said that last week that, you know, we don't want to have God giving us these gifts and then we just set them on the shelf, unopened. That's not why he pours them out on us. And a lot of times we look past the gifts of God and they're sitting on a shelf, unused. So we have to do our part. Our identity as sons and daughters of God is God's gift to us. God's gift to us. And then going forward, living in the world as redeemed children of God is our gift back to God. What that means is we are taking these gifts that God gives us, we're living them out for others to see as a living example of God's grace in action. God's grace in action. Living in the world as redeemed children of God means we have to live it out. We have to take God's grace and put it on display for the rest of the world to see. And what it means to be children of God, living our example out to others is not just mouthing words once a week. Again, we need to do our part. After all, God has already done his. God's already done his. He's poured out his grace upon us freely and openly. A while back, I talked about different types of grace and they're all important to our understanding of our place in God's family. But I think justifying grace is one that we really can grab, grab a hold of. And justifying grace reconciles us to God and incorporates us into the body of Christ and sets us on that journey towards a wholeness of life. Grace is our salvation through Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus means he is the Savior, Jesus. That's what his name actually means, Christ Jesus. So then comes the question, can God, can those who God has forgiven reject his grace? And I heard this on the radio uh, about a year or two ago, 
as I was driving out east and uh, I listened to uh, Sirius XM satellite radio and it's just a Christian channel and, and it's awesome by the way I love it no commercials and you just can go down the road and really get into it so there's a concept that is and was widely preached that says once saved always saved and it's called eternal salvation the problem is it's not supported by scripture at all. And the gentleman that I was listening to on the radio who was talking about this um, is a well-known evangelist. And, and he says, well, can those that God has forgiven ever reject his grace? And the answer is, well, yes, we can. Hebrews 2, 1 and 3 says, therefore, we must give more earnest heed to the things that we have heard lest we drift away. For if the spoken word through the angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? So it says, God's giving us these gifts and we've heard about them and we know about them and we've been taught about these gifts. We've been taught about salvation. We've been taught about what God is doing for us. Now, if we reject it, what happens to us? See, the, the words of the angels came and they proclaimed God's grace. They proclaimed God's mercy. They proclaimed God's free and open love, his agape love for us. It's up, up to us then to accept that grace, to accept that mercy to accept that love and live it out and not reject it or neglect it. We can't put it up on the shelf. That's exactly what they're saying. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? We can't. Because come the day that we have to stand before the throne of God, if we neglect the grace and mercy and love that God is showing us and we put it aside, then he's going to say, hey, I gave you all these things and you rejected me. You neglected me. And so therefore, depart from my presence. I don't think anybody else here in this room wants that to happen. I certainly don't. So there's many verses that show that as long as we do not reject the gift of God's grace through continued neglect, bitterness, or come to ultimately reject God, or fall away, we are indeed assured of salvation. So if we don't do all the bad stuff, guess what? We're assured of that salvation. We're assured to come before the throne, and as judgment is being ready to pass down to us, Jesus steps in front of us and says, I've already paid the price. I paid the price on the cross. You get a free pass. You get into God's grace. You get into so we don't need to live in worry, but we can be confident that God will see us through. And that's what Paul meant when he was talking to the Philippians in 1.6. It says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, when Jesus comes back. So God starts this work in us, and he says, I will make sure that that work gets completed by the time that Christ comes to take you back home. What do we have to do? We have to accept it. And we have to live it out. We just need to stay in process with God. To continue repenting. Continue growing. And continue to overcome with his help. And this concept is grow, go, and show. We're supposed to grow in our knowledge of the Spirit. And the Word says that He will reveal all things unto us as we get in communion with God. As we are joined together, as we are reconciled to God, He will reveal His mysteries to us. And He will help us overcome. And that's called growth. And then He says what in the Great Commission? Jesus says, go into all nations and make disciples of all peoples, not just the Jewish community, but of all peoples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. And 
And what does he say at the end? He says, and lo, I will be with you to the end of the age. The Great Commission. So he says, I'm not sending you out to do all this on your own. I'm sending an advocate on my part. I'm sending the Holy Spirit to dwell within you, to help you abide in me, and to be able to go out and do the mighty works that you need to do in my name. He's given us all power and authority to go out and do these things. But we have to go out and do them. Grow, go, and show others that love, that grace, that mercy that you've received from God. That you continue to receive from God. That outpouring of His Spirit upon us. Grow, go, and show. It's a very important concept. So that prompts the question, does God place conditions on his gift of salvation? So what if I said time and time and time again, an agape love, an agape gift is one that's given with no strings attached, right? Again, if we look at the scriptures, God's word tells us that in Matthew 7, 21, he says, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven Will be accepted in. Jesus made it clear that merely acknowledging him as Lord and Master, saying, Lord, Lord, is not sufficient. You can't do it by the words of your mouth. That's what I talked about in the very first scene in the message this morning. See, that's just not sufficient. To inherit the kingdom of God, we must do the will of the Father. As he clearly stated in John 16, it tells us that whoever, whosoever believes in him, shall not perish but have eternal life. So yeah, we do have to do some things. It means that God's grace, by God's grace, he's made that way for us to have, not earn, eternal life. But, but, it is contingent upon believing that Jesus is the Son of God and he was sent for our salvation. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I'm giving you the gift of grace I'm giving you the gift of salvation. We are saved by grace, not by works. We are saved by grace. It's contingent upon believing that Jesus is the Son of God, set for our salvation. Jesus wants us to understand that there is more to receiving eternal life than just belief or mental acceptance. See, he wants our conviction. That he is our savior. And it has to be much more than just a warm, comforting thought or intellectual concept. Jesus warns us that simply calling upon his name or recognizing him as Lord is not enough. He wants that relationship. He wants you to call upon him daily in prayer. That's how we talk to him. That's how he talks to us. See, a lot of people, they're saying, well, God never talks to me because I can't hear his voice. But it's the urging of our heart. It's the urging of the Spirit. He talks through the Holy Spirit and urges us away from danger. And he urges us towards his will and fulfilling his will. Jesus' example of grace and action brings us to the verse I chose for our call to worship this morning. He has saved us and called us to a holy night, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Because of his own purpose and grace, we need to live out his will, not ours for our lives. If we live out our will for our lives, guess what? We're going to stumble through life. We're going to get lost. But if we live out the grace by the grace of God, if we live out Jesus' will for our lives, guess what? We have a fulfilled life, a full, filled life. This grace was given to Jesus before the beginning of time. And Paul says in his letter to the Romans, he talks about a new covenant from God. When we talk about and we're taking our communion in here, we talk about a new covenant of God. We hold up the cup and we say, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And the reason we do that is because God, through Christ, gave us a new covenant. He gave us a promise. 
And we need to understand that. We need to take a hold of that and understand what that truly means. And it's based upon the grace of God through Jesus. And it's how it replaced the covenant under the laws of Moses. So if we go back, you got people who are still trying to live out their lives under the Old Testament laws. When Jesus came and fulfilled those laws. Romans 6, 14 says, Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Jesus came and fulfilled the law, so you and I don't have to. What is the meaning of you're not under the law? You're probably saying to yourselves right now. But under grace, we need to fully understand without God's law, there would be no need for grace. And how without Jesus Christ, the grace of forgiveness would not be possible. Under the law of Moses, there are strict laws and observances that had to be followed. Sacrifices that had to be made to God. Everything had to be made ritually clean. There are over 630 laws that were taught that had to be de be observed to be in the club, if you will, at the time. But God sent Jesus to fulfill the law and to break the barriers of the club. His sacrifice was the final sacrifice that needed to be made. We don't have to take a blood sacrifice to him to fulfill what is called for in the law of Moses. See, Jesus fulfilled the law. He was the final sacrifice. That's why in our communion time, we're called to remember that his body was broken, whipped, beaten, nailed to the cross. His ankles were broken. His blood poured out of his body to wash us clean of our sins. The cup of the new covenant, saved by grace, saved by grace. His sacrifice was the final sacrifice that needed to be made. And if you don't understand that you're still trying to fulfill the old law and you're missing the point of why Jesus came in the first place. Because all the other stuff didn't work. This is a new testament. It is a new testament to God and what his plan was for our life. That's why it's called a new testament. He put a new plan in place. He put a new person here. He put grace, a living model of grace and mercy and love for us to see, to be with, to understand. That was Jesus Christ. We are saved by grace, not from anything that we could possibly do. Nothing that we could possibly do. God's goodness leads us to repentance and a changed and improved life. An improved life. I want you to understand that. When we were dead in our sins, we were simply doing life. Not living a fulfilled life. God wants us to live a fulfilled life. Not just go through the motions on a daily basis. And through faith in Christ, we receive God's grace to live a fulfilled life. The Apostle Paul states that Christians are not under the law in Galatians uh, 3, 19 and 20. The Ten Commandments, the moral law, the law of Moses, are not an exception to this freedom. We trust Jesus as our sacrifice and as our daily source of morality and ethics. He was a living example placed among us because the other examples didn't work. We are too blind to them as people. And we followed our own will. So he says, follow Jesus. And that's what our whole study has been about. Following in the footsteps of the Savior. When we need grace. And we need it every day. <clears throat> Christ within us by the Holy Spirit, apart from the law, is enough to produce the godly life we desire and that we need. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
and there is no law against such things. And those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Through faith by the Spirit, we are granted these gifts of grace of the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 through 25. See, he's telling us these things as living examples of what he's doing for us. And he says, by your faith in me and by taking on my will, submitting yourself to my will, I will give you these things. And if you're not getting these things, you're not submitting to Christ. You're not submitting your life. Because he promises by his word that the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And it says there's no law against these things. Meaning, we don't have to worry about the laws of old because they no longer apply. I am giving you these things to have a good and fulfilled life. Grace is universally needed by everyone. Everyone. The prodigal son who, who strays away and says, I want my inheritance, and, and to me, you're, you're dead to me. And his father gives us his inheritance. He goes out and blows it. And he comes back. See, that grace allowed that father to send a robe out to put on a son that told his father that he was dead to him. Dead to him. That's grace. That's mercy. That's love. That example of the prodigal is our example that God has for us. No matter how far we stray away, God's going to grade us with grace, love, and mercy. And he's going to call us back home. So everyone, from the prodigal son to the well-adjusted righteous person who still falls short, can only look to God's grace for salvation. See, that's you and me both. That's you and me both. Nothing of ourselves can save us, only Jesus can. Welcome to the club. Welcome to the club. Okay, so you've heard me mention something twice about a club. In our Lenten studies in here, Max talked about the Jewish community being likened to a club. You know, a bunch of people who, who think alike and act alike, and we know you make up the rules about who can join the club and who can't join the club. And we always think of a certain country club out there, you know, with greenskeepers and such. Very exclusive, very exclusive. Okay, poor reference to Caddyshack, what can I say? But see, clubs by their very nature are exclusive. And when we look at the Jewish community in, in Jesus' day, they kept the Gentiles out. They kept anybody who was not G Jewish out of their club. They said, nobody else can join. And oh, by the way, even if you're in the club, you've got to follow all these rules. You've got to do all these things. And we're going to exclude everybody else out because we are the chosen people. Sounds kind of boastful, doesn't it? And with the Pharisees in control of the Jewish community, it became not only under the law, but very exclusive. Jesus saw this and kind of shook things up, so to speak. After all, he ate with sinners. He consorted with the Gentiles. He associated with the prostitute. Can you imagine? Oh man, the gossip within the walls of that club. Can you imagine? Consorting with those types who are unclean? He saw the Jewish community as a club and that temple had become a clubhouse. Not really at all what God had intended. So he set about to change things and conform them to the will of God. After all, who knows the will of God better than Jesus? So he went out to shake things up. He said, man, you guys, you missed the point completely. Missed the point completely. In his messages to the people, he made it very clear that the kingdom of God was for everyone. The laws of Moses would be fulfilled through him. It was time for the club to disband its bylaws and open the doors to everybody, to all. In our world today, there are many churches that assimilate to the old ways of the country club. We've seen it, witnessed it firsthand, and it's really sad. 
I mentioned before that we were invited to join a, another church and we were given an application for membership. And on that membership application, it asks if you had ever done anything in the past that if it came to light, would shed a bad light for the church. Wait, what? You, you, you put this in, in an application for membership to your church? Let he is with who is out sin cast the first stone. Well, it's front and center in my mind, and, and uh, we respectfully declined membership in that clubhouse. See ya. Wouldn't want to be at the time of judgment. Okay? In all fairness, it is a large church, and they had certain standards that they wanted affirmed in the public eye. What? Wait a minute. Let's back up on that again. So... They had certain standards that they wanted to make sure they affirmed in the public eye. In other words, we don't want you to taint our image that we've made ourselves to be. What is the church for? Jesus wants the church to look like a lighthouse, a beacon to the lost to help them find their way back to God. <laughs> He wants the prodigals. He wants the bruised. He wants the wounded, the hurting, the sinners to come back and join the flock. To join the club. Not exclude them, but to join them. Here at Grace Street Church, we are a hospital for sinners, not a country club for saints. There's not one of us sitting in these chairs today or standing in front of you that is a saint. We're all sinners. We're all sinners. We teach the inspired word of God here, not the paraphrased, watered-down, politically acceptable version of his word. Not the feel-good stuff. You know, the stuff that won't make you change your lifestyle much out there. You know, that feels good stuff when you're on the wrong track and you're away from God's will and you're away from God's word. It's just too... Hey, come on, join our club. But that's not what it's all about. We want to be a lighthouse. We want God's light, his grace, his mercy, and his love shining out through us into this broken world. We, the people, the broken and the lost, are the reason Jesus went to the cross. We, the people, everybody in this room, the broken, and the lost are the reason that Jesus went to the cross. He went to the cross to reconcile the sinners of God. And newsflash, that's everyone. That's everyone. We're all sinners. We're all sinners. New concept. Clubhouse, not good. Lighthouse, good. Okay? John in the books of Acts tells that what we are supposed to be doing, Acts 10, 34. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what's right. This is the message of the good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. No exclusion there. Do you notice this? What he's saying in here? He's trying to tell these people that the club's been disbanded. Everyone is welcome. Jesus' love is for all. All. And it goes on in verse 44 to say, While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. The Gentiles. You know, those unclean guys. The enemies of the Jews. They were speaking in tongues by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, there's no exclusivity in God's club. So Peter said... Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. See, no exclusion. 
No exclusion. It is written in the word of God that all are accepted into the family of God. This is the living example of the grace of God. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. Every nation. Fear in those days meant to be obedient to God and his word. To be obedient means we need to follow God. I like to call it living out God, what God wants us to do. Now, I've mentioned it many times before. It is living out the grace of God. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me will never die, but have his everlasting life. He meant it. Whoever liveth and believeth in me will never die, but have his there's no exclusions in there. It's everyone. See, he's trying to tell us, don't exclude anybody. I don't care what they've done. If you're living in Christ, you don't have anything on an application for membership that says, hopefully you don't do anything that will tempt, taint our spirit. No. Public. Yeah. This is the salvation message. This is God's amazing grace and action. This is our salvation hope. This is our salvation hope. My message today is our call to follow and live out what God tells us that he is in his word already written down for us. We don't have to guess about it. Read it, understand it, take it in and live it out. It's meant to be our guide to life everlasting by the power and direction of the Holy Spirit. We can be assured of eternal life. Lighthouse or clubhouse, the choice is yours. Let's pray. Gracious Lord God, we come before you today and we confess that we are sinners. We are in need of your grace and mercy and we repent of our sins. And we pray for forgiveness. We pray that by the power and the blood and the love of Jesus, that we can be redeemed and made whole again in you. Lord Jesus, we ask you to come into our hearts and we make you our Lord and Savior. We thank you for your blessed assurance that we will be with you in heaven, that your spirit gives us the strength, the hope, and the love to be your disciples in this lost world. Lord, we lift up our lives our church, our city, and our state, and our nation to you. We ask that you would do a mighty act of healing in us and in the world. That your word and that your name would be boldly proclaimed. And that your works would be done. Embolden us today. Empower us today to step up and step out. To bring home the lost. Lead us to growth in your spirit and keep us unto you. Lord God, in your precious name we pray today. appropriate the slide that you use for Jeannie, for our brokenness and grace. It is. Because it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took the bread and he broke it, telling his disciples, this is my body, broken for you. Take it. <coughs> Towards the end of the meal, he took the cup and he filled it. After blessing and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you. And he said, For many. Not just the twelve that were sitting there. Not just the followers that were there at the time, but for all of earthly time until he returns. Father, we thank you that in Sharing this meal together one, each week, we do see where our brokenness meets your grace. That everything that you've done, and I said, those things that could blemish someone else's image, 
that could blend us our own image. That all these things that people could look down on us for, God's grace meets us in our brokenness. The body of Christ is broken for you. Take me. The blood of Christ shed for you. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for what this meal represents to us. And that the way that we take this meal will not even compare to when Jesus returns and has this meal with us someday. We thank you that you do meet us in our brokenness through your grace. In Jesus' name. Steve and Denise are traveling this weekend. They're off visiting uh, his mom, Jen, and his brother, Larry, which they haven't seen since Christmas because of all the things that have gone on in their lives. But by God's grace, they may have had safe travel. We pray that they will have safe travel back with the, the weather that we're having. And I can look out the window now and see that it's already starting to come down. We also prayed for yesterday for safe travel for all of our family and friends and we have a couple of family members that are still traveling today um, one back to Webster City and one all the way seems like far away compared to your travels it's not very far but all the way back to Sioux City John is taking his kids back, back to, to South Dakota okay so our prayers for John and his three children as he takes them back to South Dakota this weekend but also as he returns here uh, and uh, we'll see him again soon. Uh, prayers for, certainly for uh, the family of Tyler Brandt, who passed suddenly yesterday. It's hard enough to see a family member, uh, especially a parent, go before you, but to have a younger sibling or a child uh, is, would be devastating. So prayers for that family. Are there any other praises or prayers? Besides Mark traveling again this week? Uh, Wednesday. Wednesday? Next week I'm in Chattanooga. Much further than South Dakota. <laughs> well, Heavenly Father, we know there are things that people are going through that are unsaid that they are speaking to you about. Some of them aren't, might not even be doing that, Father. Father, we pray that they would turn to you. We pray that they would lift those things up to you. Father, for those that do not know you, we ask that they would have a softened heart that someone would come into their lives and introduce them to the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. That they would come into a relationship with you by the power of the Holy Spirit, as only you can do. Father, we pray for those who have lost loved ones. We pray for those who have been traveling and are still traveling. We pray for those who are hurting. On our prayer list, we have so many that are in need of of prayer, whether it's from our own congregation here or friends and family of such. We just pray for a healing, Father. We pray for a comfort and peace to come about them that only you can give. A comfort and peace that regardless of the outcome of what they're going through, they will be okay. So, Father, we just pray as we go through this life and into the next that you would guide us home to our eternal home with you. Father, we just thank you and praise you for all of these things. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I wanted to start off by saying yesterday I couldn't remember what I ate for breakfast, so. 
today I forgot my hearing aids. I was trying to figure out why everything just kind of seemed dull. <laughs> Couldn't hear much today, so. Um, but God is good through everything. So when I came in this morning, my eyes were weeping because my head was just splitting. Um, God took the headache away. <laughs> he took it away. I have no pain right now. That's God's grace. That's God's mercy. That's God's love and action. Let's go to God and tell him how great he is today. Dear God, we come before you today feeling weak, uncertain. Sometimes we're just struggling to find the courage to take on challenges that lie ahead of us. Gracious God, please grant us the grace and the fortitude we need to endure and overcome those things that just seem larger than life. Help us to trust you in your plan and know that you are walking with us each and every step of the way. Fill us today with your strength and your peace. Give us the wisdom to make good decisions. Lord, today we offer up our struggles to you. We offer up our pain to you. We offer up our suffering to you. And we ask that you carry us through this difficult time. Heavenly Father, we're in need of your strength and guidance to help us stay focused on you and not our circumstances. When we feel overwhelmed and unsure of how to move forward, please give us the courage to face our fears and the determination to keep on going. Help us to trust in you and in your loving presence and know that you are with us always. Fill us full of your peace. Fill us full of your grace. Fill us full of your wisdom and your love. Help us to never lose hope. Bring your Holy Spirit into us today and fulfill us. Help us to be strong in body and mind and spirit. Grant to us the endurance to keep going when things are tough. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for releasing us from our past sins and our mistakes. May we be filled with your love and your light. And let us show that light out into a broken world. To call the prodigals home. To call the broken home. To call the needy home. May we use your strength to serve you and others with kindness and compassion. Today and every day. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So the music I picked for you today, I want you to kind of pay attention to the words because it gives you different examples of God's grace and action. It talks about how no matter what we're struggling through in our lives, He's there and He'll bring us through.